we can read the scriptures in different ways and for different purposes. Some of those ways and purposes are unhelpful and can actually be harmful, but we're not going to talk about those today. The two most helpful ways to read and study scripture, I think, are first for information and second for transformation. Both of these ways are important to our faith journeys. As we seek to better understand God, humanity, and the relationship between God and humanity. Now, when we study the Bible for information, we need to dedicate ourselves to some serious Bible study. That means we need to delve into what the words mean in their original language, whether that be Hebrew or Greek. It means we need to know the context of the passage, what comes before it in Scripture and what comes after it. We also need to discover the historical context. What was going on in the world when the story itself actually happened? And what was going on in the world when the story was written down at a later time? This all requires a library of biblical resources, much like what we have here in the St. James Curriculum Library. Here you will find Bible dictionaries, atlases, commentaries, and many more resources to help you as you seek deeper information about the scriptures. Now, on the other hand, when we read the Bible for transformation, we need to dedicate ourselves to some serious prayer. Reading the Bible for transformation means searching it for what God has to say to us today through a certain passage. When we do so, we discover that we may hear one message from God today. And then when we read the same passage a week, a month, a year later, we hear a very different message from God. Now, both messages are good and acceptable in that time, so long as we remember the next very important aspect of transformational Bible study. Reading the Bible for transformation requires that we be open to the presence of the Holy Spirit, who will speak into our hearts the message that God has for us today. Now, as we go into our scripture passage for today, I want us to consider this passage, and it's Psalm 24, through the transformational lens. That means that this sermon will be a little different from your typical sermon. In this sermon, we're going to be asking, what might God be saying to you? What might God be saying to me through this passage today? Now, as I read this to you, I want you to close your eyes, if you're comfortable doing so, and listen as I slowly read the words of this psalm. Now, for those of you who listen to the daily prayers videos, you know that when I'm reading a scripture passage in which Yahweh, the name of God, is translated as the English word Lord, I I'd like to substitute the name true life. God is true life to us. And when we speak that truth, it helps us to see the scripture in a different light. So hear now these words of Psalm 24. The earth is true life's and all that is in it. The world and those who live in it. For God has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of true life? And who shall stand in God's holy place? 
those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from true life and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek God, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? True life, strong and mighty. True life, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? True life of hosts. He is the King of glory. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so to begin, I want us to consider the question, where is God? This psalm begins by declaring that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. What does that tell you about where you can find God? Donald L. Hicks offers this beautiful image to help us answer that question. Listen to the murmur of water and you'll hear Mother Nature. Listen to the stillness beneath and there you'll find God. The psalmist said the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. God is all around you if you only have the eyes to see and the ears to listen in the silence. Knowing that, where is it easiest for you to see and hear God? Allow yourself to go there in your mind. Now, it will probably be easier to do this if you close your eyes again. Look at all you see as you look around that place. Know that it all belongs to God. And God, out of pure love, has shared it with you. What does that tell you about God? What does it tell you about how God feels about you and about this special place that you are in? Psalmist next asks the question, who shall ascend the hill of true life? And who shall stand in God's holy place? Well, we may well ask, where is this hill? Where is this holy place? Teresa of Avila, a nun back in the 16th century, wrote about this aspect of finding God in her classic book, Interior Castle. She wrote, I began to think of the soul as if it were a castle made of a single diamond or a very clear crystal in which there are many rooms. The soul of a righteous person is nothing but a paradise in which, as God tells us, he takes his delight. This castle contains many mansions, and midst of them all is the chiefest mansion, 
where the most secret things pass between God and the soul. So once we put ourselves either in reality or in our imagination in that place where we can most easily encounter God's presence, we need to take another step, this time inward. Having encountered God's presence in the world around us, we must now find God within us. The psalmist tells us that in order to do this, we must have clean hands and pure hearts. And we must not lift up our souls to what is false and not swear deceitfully. This is not a state we can attain on our own. Only by fully trusting in God can our lives be transformed into this way of being. And when we allow that to happen, our hearts will be made pure and our souls will be lifted up to the one true God and to none other. When we are transformed, our hands will be made clean and our interactions with others will be authentic, full of integrity and empty of deceit. Now, this doesn't mean that we cannot encounter God until we reach this place of transformation. If that were the case, none of us would get very far. What we need to do is to move toward this place, allow it to be done unto us by God, and allow God to move us closer and closer to that center room of our souls that Teresa of Avila described. It is a journey, but one that is blessed by God. So allow yourself now to reach your soul out toward the Spirit of God. In this moment, that's all you need to do. As you continue to practice this, reaching out to God with a willingness to be changed, God will draw you up that hill and ever closer to God's heart, ever deeper into that holy place within your own soul. The psalm ends by declaring repeatedly, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. These gates, these ancient doors are found in our own souls. Oh, how many times we slam them shut when God tries to enter. We fear what God will ask of us. We fear what God will want to do in us and through us. We fear the changes we will need to make in our lives if we open them and allow God to come deeper into our souls. Is it worth it, we ask? Who is this God who seeks to enter into the deepest places of my heart and mind, into the most intimate places of my soul? The psalmist asks that same question and then offers an answer. True life, strong and mighty. True life, mighty in battle. It is true life wanting to move into our souls, ready to battle the demons that lie within us. We may think we have been pursuing true life through our families, our careers, our recreations, our everyday rat race lives. But in truth, these very things, as good as they may be, may be pulling us away from what is really true life. It's not that we need to completely give up these other things, but we do need to put them in their proper place 
after our relationship with God. All of the other pursuits of this life will come to an end. Our family will grow up and move away. Some will die. Our careers will end. Sometimes in retirement, sometimes in an unexpected job loss, and sometimes because we just realize that we've been on the wrong track. Our recreations will end, perhaps because we outgrow them or because our bodies no longer allow us to enjoy them. However it happens, all of these temporal things will end. Only God will remain. And God will be there forever. Reading this psalm through this transformational lens, we discover that God is calling us to put God first, to open ourselves up in complete trust to this transforming hand of God and to the guiding spirit of God. When we do this, everything else will fall into its proper place. As Jesus reminds us in his Sermon on the Mount, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And all these other things will be given to you as well. Deepak Chopra wrote, How can you seek God if he's already there? It's like standing in the ocean and crying out, I want to get wet. You want to get over the line to God. It turns out he was always there. Grace comes to those who stop struggling. When it really sinks in that there's nothing you can do to find God, he suddenly appears. That's the deepest mystery, the only one that counts. God is here with you. God is within you. God is waiting for you to open the gates of your soul to let him in. And that's all you need to do. The only question is, will you? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.